Good morning, brethren. I want to welcome you back to our School of the Word. It's been nice um, having you study the Word with us. My name is Martin Nurenda. I'm a Bible teacher. That's just what I love doing. I love teaching the Word. In this course, I'll be your tour guide as we embark on this life-changing journey through the Old Testament. The last couple of weeks, we've been seeing the sights of the world of the Old Testament. We've taken a trip to the ancient Near East, and we've seen what type of um, area it was. It was an area surrounded by a number of um, mountainous areas, such as the Taurus Mountain, the Caucasus Mountains, and it was also an area with a lot of um, waterways, such as a number of uh, seas, the Caspian Sea, the Red Sea, the Dead Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Nile River, the Euphrates, the Tigris, also a place of um, a number of uh, dry areas, desert areas, the Arabian Desert, the Sahara Desert, the Sinai Desert, and we say that located in the middle of all this was a place known as the Promised Land. So we've seen a lot of sites. The last week we were looking, taking a tour of the Promised Land. We saw how the land can be divided into six major parts to understand it better. The coastal plain, the Shepela, the highlands, the Araba, the Transjordan, and, of course, not forgetting the Negev. And we looked at three of those areas, and we took some time to take some of the biblical events that we read about and place them in their right place where they took place, such as where David defeated Goliath. That was in the Valley of Elah, and the Valley of Elah was located in the highlands in the hill country of the promised land. And we also saw that when Jonah ran away from God's calling, he went to the coastal plain, to the city of Joppa, a port city, got his transport from there to run away to a place known as Tashish. We also saw that the same coastal plain, a place of, called Caesarea, very, very important in the life of Paul. A lot of his events took place in that one place. Even Peter, he met centurion, Cornelius, in the city of Caesarea. So we've done quite a bit of traveling around. Going forward, we are going to take some time and um, put aside our nice, warm, cozy clothes and do some work. This time we're going to do some work. We're going to do some digging. We are going to go into the Word and dig a bit. Try and uncover as much as we can. So let's take our boots, let's take the spade, let's take the trowel, and let's go and dig. Welcome once again. Now before we begin digging, let's just pause in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we bless you and thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we can get into your word. Father, as we begin to dig into your word, we ask you to give us insight. Give us a spirit of wisdom and understanding in the knowledge of you. That, Father, as we get into your word, it will become life to us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and ask. Amen and amen. Well, welcome again. So today we'll begin to dig, get into the word, so pick up your Bible, get your notebook, and let's do some digging. We're beginning a study today, this morning, and in the next session, we're looking at the people that make up, or that we meet in the Old Testament. I'm sure when you read the Old Testament, you come across quite a few number of people, quite a number of people that you meet in there. Some of them, you wonder where they came from. Let's begin by saying, the nations and the people 
that surrounded ancient Israel and Judah actually helped to shape their origins, their history, and their culture. Some of those people were immediate neighbors of Israel and Judah. And many of those people can actually be understood. As we look at the Old Testament in terms of their relationship to Israel. Or sometimes they use the term to Jacob as the father of the nation, so to say. So as we look at these people in the Old Testament, we need to keep one thing in mind. Many of these people are closely related. Closely related. One way or the other. Through ancestry or through kinship to the people of Israel and Judah. Take for instance, Genesis 19. We read about Noah, I mean, I mean about Lot, after he had left Sodom and Gomorrah, his wife, in disobedience, looked back at the city she was going to miss, and the Bible tells us she was turned into a pillar of salt. The daughters of Lot, their husbands felt they didn't, they didn't see the sense of leaving their lives behind and running off to a wilderness when there's no proof that what Lot was saying was really going to happen. And those gentlemen perished in Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot was left with two of his daughters, his oldest and his youngest daughter. The two daughters connived together and decided that since there are no men around that we know, if we don't do anything about it, we will perish and our legacy will go down as well. So they chose to make their father drunk, really drunk, to the point that he was not thinking anymore, and they decided to sleep with their father. If you look at Genesis 19, we are told that these two daughters slept with their father and they had children, two sons. One was called Ben-Ami and the other was called Moab. So these two children, these two sons, born to Lot and an incestuous relationship between him and his daughters, actually are the ancestors of the ones we meet in the Bible known as the Ammonites, and the Moabites. So the Ammonites and the Moabites are actually related to Lot. They are his children. And related to the Israelites, to the people of God, the people of promise, in that sense. But though they were part of Abraham's family through their ancestors, they were not connected to the original Jacob or Israel as part of God's chosen people. Another example I can give you, Genesis 36. We all know the story. Isaac had a wife, Rebecca. She was expecting twins, Jacob and Esau. And she was given a promise by God Two nations are in your womb, and they're fighting, but the older will serve the younger. But we'll get to that later. So those two boys born from Rebekah, Jacob and Esau, were brothers, related to Abram as part of his ancestry. They were his descendants. Jacob became the father of the Israelites, and Esau became the ancestor or the father of a group we meet in the Bible known as the Edomites. So these three groups, examples that I've just given, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites, were really part of Abraham's family. 
through their ancestors. And so, in a way, they were related to the original Jacob or Israel. But they were not part of God's chosen people. The chosen line came through Jacob. So you read through that whole scenario, that whole sequence, you read through that. And if you think of Adam, we all know he's the father of nation, of all of us. However, Adam's descendants all perished in the flood of Noah. And then a new ancestry sort of began through Noah and his three sons. So from Genesis 9, we begin to see that this kinship, this relationship, this part of being one with another, part of being of each other, actually extended to all the nations of the known world of the time. So you need to keep that in mind, that most of the people you are going to meet in the Old Testament are actually, in a sense, related to one another. Genesis 10 introduces something we call, we know, we are, what is known as the table of nations. Once again, it demonstrates that kinship and that descent that we all have connected to Noah. Adam, of course, is regarded as the father of all humanity. However, like we say, the descendants of Adam were destroyed in the global flood of Noah. Please do understand, the flood of Noah was global. It was not a local flood. It was global. I've been made to understand that there are places, even in South Africa, where you can see signs of where the flood, or where the waters receded once upon a time many, many years ago. I just waiting for this COVID thing to get done. I'm making a couple of trips to some of those two places to go and see this proof for myself, so to say. So the table of nations in Genesis 10 gives us an account of how humanity was dispersed over the face of the earth after the global flood of Noah. So that table of, Ma of nations represents the biblical view that all nations descend from Noah through his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You can read a little bit about that in Genesis 10, 32, which just gives a summary of how the people dispersed over the nations after the flood. So when we look at the people of the Old Testament, we're going to try and study them in three ways. We want to understand the people that lived within the borders of the Promised Land, within the borders of Israel and Judah. Secondly, we want to see the people who lived on the borders, just outside the promised land. And thirdly, we we'll discuss those occupying empires. However, the occupying empires will not study in this, at this stage. We will study the occupying empires in a later course. But one thing to keep in mind as we go through this study is that as Israel came into the promised land, the way other people groups present in Palestine or Canaan, as Israel came to the land. And God said to them that they were going to occupy those places. If you remember last week we said in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 7, the areas they were going to occupy. And many of those places, in actually in those places there were people who were residing in those areas. So there are people living in the earth. So we said we're going to look at it in three ways. The people were within Canaan, within the borders of Israel and Judah. Secondly, the people were on the borders, on the outside of Israel and Judah. And of course, the occupying empires. 
Let's begin with the people who were within the land. As Israel came to the land, the land of Canaan, the land of Palestine, the promised land, there were some people who were residing in those places. So the first people we meet who were living in the area are people called the Canaanites. Now, who are these Canaanites? The first mention of Canaan we have in Scripture is a reference to Canaan, the grandson of Noah. In Genesis 12, Noah is promised the land, I mean, Abram is promised the land of Canaan. In Genesis 26, verse 3, Genesis 28, verse 13, and Genesis 35, verse 12, God repeats the promise to Isaac and to Jacob. So Genesis 12, gives a, God gives a promise to Abram. He was given the land of Canaan. Genesis 26, 28, and 35, God repeats the promise about the land that was given to, 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 Noah, to, I mean, to, to Abraham, repeats the promise to Isaac and to Jacob. We know the story of Joseph, went into Egypt as a slave, rose to become the vizier of the land, brought his family into Egypt as guests of the pharaoh. When that pharaoh was there, host died, new pharaohs decided to turn them into slaves. In Genesis 50, 24, Jake, Joseph reminds his brothers about the promise God had made to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. So that promise stood. When God called Moses in Exodus 3, and verse 8 and verse 17, God repeats the promise. So God made the promise to Abram, repeated the promise to Isaac, Jacob, Joseph repeated the promise to his brethren, and God repeated the promise to Moses at the call of Moses at the burning bush. So those people that were in that land, if you study scripture, are actually considered as people who have been dispossessed by God through his decree, although that decree was not completely executed by the Israelites, by the people of the promise. And uh, many of these people, the Canaanites, continued to live among the Israelites thereafter. So the first group of people we meet as we enter the promised land are the Canaanites. What do we know about the Canaanites? In Joshua chapter 3, verse 10, we read about seven nations who occupied the land of Canaan. One of those nations was the Canaanites. Genesis 15, from 18 to 21, we read about ten nations that occupied the land of Canaan. And two of those tribes included the Canaanites and the Amorites. So Canaanites were among one of the groups of people that were living within the land of Canaan before Israel came to possess the land. The second group we meet is a group known as the Amorites. The Amorites were an ancient nation and they are mentioned frequently in the Old Testament. The study of scripture will show that the Amorites descended from one of the sons of Canaan. Canaan was a son of Ham. You find that in Genesis 10, 15, and 16. In some ancient texts, Amorites are also known as the Amura or the Amuri. Now, if you remember Genesis, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 9, verse 7, 
in our last session, we said that Israel was told to occupy a number of places. One of those places was the hill country of the Amorites. And if you go through a study of the Old Testament and Scripture, we find that Israel defeated many Amorite kings in battle. Two of those kings that are mentioned are Sihon and Og. Or Og. And in Deuteronomy 31, we are introduced to five Amorite kings who were also defeated by Israel. However, when you come to the book of Samuel, in 1 Samuel 7, verse 14, during the time of Samuel, the prophet and the judge, it appeared that there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. But if you go further into the book of Kings, in 1 Kings 9, 20 and 21, we read that King Solomon forced the remaining Amorites into slavery. The last mention of the Amorites is in the book of Amos chapter 2, verse 10. That's the last time the Amorites are mentioned in Scripture. That's the last biblical mention of the Amorites in Scripture. So either the Amorites all died, or they were absorbed into Israel. The third group of people we meet who were living in the land, so to say, are the Phoenicians. Now, if you remember in our last session, we said you can break up the promised land into six parts. The first part we said was the coastal plain. That coastal plain says stretches from Gaza at the end, near the border of Egypt or near the Negev, Gaza, right through up towards Lebanon. It was only broken up by Mount Carmel. You remember Mount Carmel? The place where Elijah defeated the 400 prophets of Baal. And just nearby Mount Carmel was the River Kidron, River Kishon, rather, where Elijah executed all these 400 prophets of Baal. Now, slightly just above there was the land of the Phoenicians, also on the coastal plain. They lived on the Syrian, on the Lebanese coastal plain, just north of a place known as Akko. Their main cities were cities of called Biblos, Tyre, you've read about Tyre many times in Scripture, and Sidon, you've read about Sidon many times in Scripture. The location of the Phoenicians along the sea made it easier for them to trade with many places because they were near the sea, they could trade with Egypt, they could trade with Greece, they could trade with Cyprus. When you read Genesis 10, the table of nations, we are told that the land of Canaan included Sidon as well. So if Sidon was a city of the Phoenicians, originally that place, Phoenicia, was part of the promised land. The fourth people we meet as we take our tour of the promised land, or as we look at the people of the Old Testament, are the Philistines. In our last session, we discussed the Philistines in quite some detail. We said that they occupied the coastal plain and that five major cities, Gaza, Gath, Ashkelon, Ekron, and Ashdod. The champion of the Philistines came from a city called Gath. The champion, Goliath. The champion that David defeated with a sling and five stones. That story we read in the book of 
the Samuels, the book of Samuel, first Samuel, and the books of Judges. Other events we remember that last week that we looked at last week were that the Philistines were the perennial enemies of God's people. And if you remember, we said Saul and his sons lost their lives in a battle with the Philistines on the Mount Gilboa, Mount Camel range of mountains. That's where they lost their lives. All the three sons of Saul fell in that battle. Jonathan, Aminadab, Malkishua. They all fell in that battle. Saul committed suicide. Fell on his own sword after he was injured by the archers of the Philistines. And then the next day when the Philistines came to to take whatever they could manage from all those who had been killed in battle, to strip all of them, they found Saul and his sons, and we are told in Scripture that they beheaded Saul, took off his armor and placed it in, one, in, in, their, in uh, the temple of their gods, and they sent the word around about that they had defeated Saul, their enemy. So the Philistines were also in the promised land. They, are part, they, they formed part of the people of the Old Testament that we find in the promised land. Remember the stories of Samson were also against the Philistines. If you go further, so these are the four main before we go further, these are the four main people groups that we find were actually residing in Canaan before Israel came to the land. And some of them lived with Israel and battled, did battle with Israel. Now much of the information that we gather about the lives of these people were in the promised land, in the land of Canaan, in Palestine, is actually drawn from documents in, a, in Mesopotamia in a place known as Ugarit. Ugarit, those documents tell us about the type of trade the people were involved in, the wealth that the trade brought to them. But for biblical scholars, what is of pertinent importance are the libraries of texts that we get from this area. We are able to understand the system of writing, the various myths that were there among these people, the various cults that they worshipped. That can be gleaned as we look at these libraries that have been uncovered by archaeologists about these people groups in that area called Ugarit. That's where these documents are found. Now, of course, they are not written on paper like we do. They're written on cuneiform tablets, tablets of, of um, mud that are baked in the sun and wedge-shaped. Shapes were made in those tablets. Like we said, one of the earlier sessions, the British Library has floors of cuneiform tablets that have been uncovered, unearthed from this area in Mesopotamia, in the ancient Near East. Now, why am I emphasizing this? Because it just tells you that scholars who come up and say Moses could not have written the first five books of the Bible are simply misinformed. Because these people well, from this area in Ugarit were able to unearth tablets of clay in Kinei form that showed that there was writing existing at the time. And what would stop Moses writing when he grew up in the, area of the, in, in, in the palace? 
Why wouldn't we write? It's just biasness towards the clear teaching of Scripture. What type of gods did these people have in this area? There's a multiplicity of gods, but most of the gods in this area were polytheistic. Many gods. If you read in the book of Judges chapter 6, 25 to 32, the story of Gideon was called by God to bring deliverance to the people of God. We read in, in, in Judges 6 that Gideon tore down the altar of Baal. Baal, the god of storms. He also cut down pieces of an image of wood that was beside the altar. Now, what was this image? Many biblical scholars believe that is a reference to the goddess Asherah, the wife of Baal. So Baal, the god of storms, the most important god in Ugarit and in that region, his wife was Asherah, and Gideon, after God called him, broke down the altar of Baal and cut in pieces the image of Asherah. That the people of the village, when they woke up in the morning and found their god cut to pieces, the altar destroyed, and a new altar built in the place and the bull offered to God, they wanted the head of Gideon. They wanted to kill him for what he had done to their God. Baal basically just simply means Lord. He was a God of storms, but it simply means Lord. And sometimes it's used in Prulo, the Baals. A document from Ugarit known as the Epic of Baal tells us that Baal overcame someone called Mot. Mot is death. That would refer to cycles of rain and drought, seed and harvest, death and life. So Baal overcame this. He was the most important god in the region. Closely associated with Baal was the god Dagon. If you read scripture, you remember Dagon, the God in whose temple the Ark of the Covenant was placed by the Philistines after they captured it in 1 Samuel 4 from the Israelites after they had killed Saul and his children, his sons. The next morning, Dagon was on his face before the Ark of God. They cleaned him up, put him in his rightful place. The following day when they came, he was in pieces. So the, the Philistines had to take the ark and place it at the border, town of Beth Shemesh. We saw that in the last session. Later it went to Kiriath Jerim, where the host of, that, of the ark was blessed. So, in Canaan, there's a multiplicity of gods. Now, one main god was Baal with his wife Asherah. Now, Baal was the god of storms, god of fertility. Now, if you look at studies and you look at the scriptures, you discover that the issues of fertility were very, of, of, of utmost importance in Canaanite religions. both for the crops and for humans, private worship or public worship, fertility was very important. Archaeologists digging in the areas even earthed many naked female figurines of these goddesses, of these issues of fertility within the land. First Kings 14 tells us the temples of Canaan contained altars, sacred pillars, and statues, and were often located on raised mounds, high places. 
And many offerings were sacrifices were offered on those altars, including what the Bible calls peace offerings. If you look at Ezekiel 21, verse 21, we are told that from this text that we uncovered in New Garit, it also sheds light on a practice known as reading the liver or reading the entrails of animals. What was that? The, the astrologers, soothsayers, the wise men of the day, some of them would cut up the liver of an, an animal and use that to try and see what the future would tell. It was known as reading the liver. If you go to the book of Daniel, you see that practice. Among those wise men who were called by King Nebuchadnezzar to tell him his dream and his interpretation were those who read the liver. So that's a kind of background in terms of religion that Israel finds itself in when they enter the promised land. They've got Ba, they're dealing with Asherah, they're dealing with Dagon, they're dealing with Beelzebul from the Philistines, they're dealing with all kinds of gods, multiplicity of gods, polytheistic cultures that they're able, that they find themselves with. So what are we saying? The four main people groups that were in Canaan when Israel entered the land were the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Phoenicians, and the Philistines. Deuteronomy 20, 15 to 18 reads, In regard to the Canaanites, God commanded, However, in the cities of the nations your Lord God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave anything that breathes, that breathes. Completely destroy them. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. As the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshipping their gods. And you will sin against the Lord your God. Why would God want Israel to obliterate and leave nothing breathing of all these people? Verse 18 is very clear. They will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods. And you will sin against the Lord your God. Unfortunately, Israel felt. And we soon read in the scriptures that they followed the practices and the religious practices and religions of these people and their gods. So these are the four main groups that were in the land. And we'll end here for today. We want to be able to have an understanding of the people that you meet that Israel found in the promised land when they came in and people you read about in the Old Testament. The Canaanites, the Amorites, Phoenicians, and the Philistines, these were groups of people that were actually in the promised land as Israel came to the land. Thank you for attending our class this morning. Today, we'll see you again in the next class. If you have any questions, any comments, please post them in the comments section on YouTube or comment on Facebook. Take time to support this channel. 
click the like, like button and consider subscribing to this channel on YouTube. The Lord bless you. We'll continue our study on the people found of the, in the, of the Old Testament and we'll consider five people that were on the borders of Israel and Judah. People we read about in the Old Testament. We just will look at them in the next class and seek to understand them. God bless you. Amen.